Uh, this is the next panel that we're uh, going to move on to as we discuss uh, the implications of the auto bailout for uh, the industry. And uh, I'm Phil LeBeau with CNBC. I uh, covered the bailout, and I'm fortunate to be joined up here with uh, three gentlemen who were uh, either in the midst of it or uh, closely associated with it. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time um, because we were listening to Larry, and I was fascinated with what he had to say. So we want to give you guys as much time to ask questions for our panelists as possible. So I'll dispense with an opening uh, remark or two, and, and I'll have each of our panelists, if you want to say something in terms of uh, before we dive into specific questions about how the bailout worked. Let's start first with Harry Wilson, who was on the uh, President's Auto Task Force, and uh, you were front and center in it. Five years later, was it successful? It's a little self-serving to say that, but I, th I like to think so. And I think the, the thing that I wanted to kind of comment on quickly was the thing that's not well understood um, by the process that General, and I want to focus on General Motors since we have the world's leading authority on Chrysler here that you'll be hearing from shortly, Mr. Marchioni. Um, but uh, there are really kind of three pieces to the GM rebirth. The first was work that was done by the management team prior to the 2009 restructurings. There have been you know, substantial improvements in product quality, in manufacturing processes. They built a successful business in China. That was not well appreciated by most of the marketplace. It was too little, too late, but it was not well appreciated, and it's part of the important bones that we found at GM when we showed up. The second part was the work that we did in 2009. And if you look at where the company was in early 2009, it basically broke even only at the peak of the cycle. And anybody who's looked at cyclical businesses knows that's not a successful recipe uh, for business. And they also had about $100 billion in liabilities that hampered investment and really weighed the company down. And our mission, the task force, was to address both those things, the cost structure so they could break even at the trough, and the liabilities so they had cash to invest in their business and continue to grow. Uh, and then the third and final piece, which is actually kind of front and center right now, was our handoff from the auto task force to the uh, new board of General Motors in August of 2009 was that we basically said a lot of good things have happened. However, the company's primary challenge remains the cultural problems that they need to address going forward. The cultural problems that got them into the mess they were in in 2009 that still persisted and needed to be fixed for the company to truly turn the corner and really be a successful long-term business. And as you see, frankly, in, in some of the recall news, and particularly this really um, inexcusable ignition switch failure, uh, the company still has a long ways to go in its cultural problems. It's made some improvements, but still a long ways to go. And so I think it's a work in progress still, but I think the changes that were made in 2009 really vaulted it from failure to the brink of success. A success, but some issues in there that were never completely resolved. Exactly. Uh, Cliff Winston with the Brookings Institute um, is a microeconomist <coughs> who has been very vocal about his opinion about whether or not the auto bailouts should have taken place. Uh, I won't say any more about that than to let you kind of take the ball and run with it, Cliff. Okay, I will take it and run with it. Um, the only vocalization that I'm aware of was an op-ed that Bob Crandall and I wrote on the Wall Street Journal entitled, Detroit Needs a Sell-Off, Not a Bailout. Uh, that's all I ever did. And then I proceeded to write a book about deregulating lawyers, which I hope you read. But um, <laughs> back to the bailout. Uh, I'm going to distill in a few minutes a uh, paper we're writing now. Okay, three parts to it. One, let's begin, take a longer view of, of this industry and begin with the 70s and trace what's happened to the market share of the Detroit Three. That's when we had the energy problems and the Chrysler bailout, and at one time a Detroit Three having a share of 85% of cars and light trucks plummeted down to 70. But things stabilized with government intervention with the VERs and, and so forth. In addition, uh, in the 60s, uh, although we didn't really know how important that would be, there was a 25% tariff put on trucks, and that later became important. Okay, the 90s was a good decade in terms of the economy, but the industry actually, again, the Detroit Three lost a good chunk of share, and I wrote a paper with Kenneth Train on that and attributed all that loss simply to relative attributes. That is, the attributes of the foreign cars in terms of price and uh, quality, reliability, and so on and so forth were sufficiently better than those of the U.S. cars that that was really denting in to, to their share. Okay. By the time it's 2000, you have much stronger competition uh, from the Korean automakers, European, Japanese still strong, and another chunk of share down, uh, <clears throat> closer to 50, and now we're up to the time of the bailout, and then in the, in the midst of the bailout, and, and shortly thereafter, it's, it's down to the mid-40s. Okay. 
So let me, I'll quickly go back to that. But that's sort of the, uh, the vision that you should see. You know, since the 70s, you know, going down, an intervention, stabilization, but at a lower level of output, going down, intervention, stabilization, so on and so forth, this long run pattern. So the question is, you know, should there have been inter another intervention and a bailout in this case? Okay, short run and long run costs and benefits. Okay. To do this, you need a counterfactual. Compared with what? You can't just say, well, we're going to bail them out, but what then would be the reasonable thing to compare that to? All right, and that's obviously going to be very important in, in thinking about this. Well, you know, one extreme, a lot of people say, look, let's just treat this as a standard bankruptcy, but that seems to be an extreme view and extremely optimistic because it was belief that there really wasn't private sector financing that would be available to take that route. The other extreme was if you don't do anything, you know, the industry is going to disappear. And that seems a little extreme, too. I don't think we're going to shut down entire production if we didn't bail out Chrysler or, or GM. We still had Ford, and obviously we had uh, the foreign automakers. So consider something in the middle, which is what we said uh, a long time ago. How about a sell-off? And what I had in mind there was that there would be entities that would be picking up the valuable assets of GM and Chrysler in terms of the light trucks and SUVs. But they'd say, look, I think we can make cars. We don't need those. All right? So that's what you have in between. With that in mind, then you think of the cost of the bailout or the money that wasn't paid back, because you're not bailing them out, and compared with the bailout that, that did it, uh, engender those costs, you're talking, what, 12 to 14 billion as the latest one. On top of that, then cash for clunkers, an indirect cost, that was a complementary policy that, that wound up costing money. Then you can tack on two additional costs related to things that, are, that in, in principle, are going to be helping GM's profits. Okay? That is, uh, the deduction in terms of the bankruptcy, being able to move forward and carry on those losses and deduct those, and possible liability settlements. So you know, maybe around $20 billion beyond the cost side. What about the benefits? The benefits are you are, at least lose, you are losing cars. In time T, when we had the bailout, there were people who wanted to buy GM and Chrysler cars. As I said, we're going to let those go. All right? So that's analyses we can do using what we call discrete choice or choice models and say, look, Suppose a car that you wanted to get was no longer available. You had to take your next best car. And actually removing GM and Chrysler cars from people's choice sets did generate a cost, that is a benefit from keeping those cars available, of about $9 billion. Then there's the big ticket item, un unemployment. Okay? Again, you've got to be very careful. How are you actually going to model what's going on? You've got to look at what consumers are going to do. All right? Their choices are not going to simply be, we're not going to buy a car. They're obviously going to go on and think about what, what can we do for our next best alternative. What are the automakers going to do? How are they going to adjust capacity? Okay, they're, they're not going to say, well, we're not going to do anything. No, they'll take advantage of this. Ford in particular, I would think, would be excited about this. Say, so, look, we're going to start ramping up production. What about the supply chain? They're not going to shut down. I mean, Ford already is producing a reasonable amount of cars, right? They'll produce even more. So you know, that's the kind of you know, calculations that's going to go on, go on in doing this. This is not an easy problem, I assure you. And I wouldn't say that we have, at this point, a definitive answer. We're still working on it. But I can say qualitatively, the cost would be substantial in, you know, in the multi-billions that would exceed the benefits in the short run. Okay? So in terms of the savings, in terms of jobs and cars that people wanted, as a short-run benefit, that exceeds the cost of the money that wasn't paid back and probably the other profit things. However, the long run, and this is what's so critical. Back to my long run analysis. This has been an industry that has just been shrinking in terms of the Detroit Three, right? It's not shrinking in a sense for bad reasons. These are consumer preferences. They have been making these choices. Now, there's a critical thing that goes on here that is different from most goods. It's a durable good. You don't buy a car every day. You don't buy a car every, every year. I don't buy a car until every 13 years, but then I buy Toyotas. Um, <laughs> All right, Porsches. Um, you know, five to seven years, OK? So what goes on during this period? Well, there's switching costs. People have to get some sort of learning, and they develop brand loyalty. What is brand loyalty? That's an attitude toward a brand through repeat purchase and experience with the car that's reinforced by information from the media and your friends. All right? Breaking brand loyalty takes a shock. What the bailout did is it prevented a shock that would have broken brand loyalty. 
Breaking brand loyalty in this industry is a good thing because the attributes of the foreign cars are better than the US cars. Now, one thing Larry didn't say in sizing up how GM and Chrysler are doing is if you look at their attributes now and compare them with the US automakers, uh, the foreign automakers, look at Power Report, Consumer Report, there's still that gap in quality, reliability. And this is this in the gap that's been driving down the shares of, of these cars. And that's the big problem. You're now denying people effectively from making their long run adjustments. Some of them have been doing it. As a matter of fact, 60% share has been doing it. All right? You've got 40% left. My argument is that in the long run, there'd be more of that, much more than we'd observe. Every year, that's a huge cost. People are not getting their first choice cars simply because brand loyalty has been maintained, if you will, in terms of this intervention. You total that cost up, that's going to be big, and it really questions the viability of the bailout. Now, let me just finish. Long run, who really cares? And let me tell you why. This has been part of an industrial policy where we're trading off consumer welfare and taxpayer money VERs, tariffs, now a bailout, to keep an industry going, OK, US industry going, at an increasingly smaller scale. This doesn't seem to me to be a kind of industrial policy that we ought to be pursuing in this country. But there's an end to it. Two words, driverless cars. They're going to happen. I've been in them. They work. They're just awesome. And they're going to completely change this industry for two reasons. One, a lot of people aren't going to own cars anymore. You know, why, why, why incur the capital costs? You want to go somewhere? You'll let your driverless car, whatever uh, supplier know, car will be there, you'll go, you'll come back, that's it. The notion of brand loyalty or preference to driverless cars is going to be much less important in this kind of world. That is what's going to dramatically change it. And we're not going to be going back to this long run trade off of trying to keep the industry going and its share at lower and lower amounts and, and having taxpayers pay for it. If there's one thing I would suggest policymakers ought to be doing, expedite the transition to driverless cars. <coughs> wow, Cliff. Yeah, opened up a little Pandora's box there with a few comments. <laughs> we'll talk about those in a bit, but I want to give Sean a chance to talk here uh, and uh, give your perspective, Sean, in terms of uh, the, uh, the impact of the auto bailout. Sean McElindon, for those of you who don't know, he is the, uh, basically the head of economic research for the Center for Auto uh, Research, and uh, you've done extensive research over the years. Um, and you, you take a different point of view than, than where Cliff is, correct? I don't buy Porsches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I buy mostly Fords and some Chryslers. Uh, I've had the GM cars, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, and I might point out that the uh, prices are higher than some of these superior cars lately. And, and two of our companies in Detroit in the last four years have out-earned per unit, both Toyota and Honda, consistently every quarter, until the last one, maybe. But, um, you know, yes, we have studied this uh, bailout. Um, we're a not-for-profit center uh, of 36 years old. Uh, we were on the campus of the University of Michigan for 22 years, and uh, we spun off. Um, in December last year, Carr released its fourth evaluation of the potential consequences for the U.S. economy of a GM and Chrysler failure in the first quarter of 2009. Our most recent and updated study measures the effects of the government intervention in the rescue jam on Chrysler by estimating the likely impact on the US economy in 2009 and 2010 if it had not occurred. So I'm looking at short-term benefits here, okay, which obviously I'm going to show you are massive. Our analysis, of course, used accurate employment and compensation data from the companies for 2009 and 10, and a well-regarded input-output forecast model supplied by Remy Incorporated. But more importantly, our estimation relied on three major assumptions about what would have happened without the uh, intervention. And uh, you know, I hope Harry can comment on some of these assumptions. Uh, one, that GM and Chrysler would have failed early in the first quarter of 2009. The credit was unavailable to allow further production or any legal restructuring effort for these companies. Also, that the company's operations could not be sold to other automakers or other investors would allow production to continue. And Mr. Perhaps Mr. Marchioni could tell us how much money he was willing to pay for Chrysler or any other auto company at that time. Yeah. <laughs> that even if the market recovered, other automakers, second assumption, would have not replaced lost GM and Chrysler capacity uh, for a considerable period of time with new capacity for years. 
in fact, because it takes years to put up a new assembly plant and train a labor force. Moss GM and Chrysler production would have been largely replaced by imports from outside of North America. Finally, the loss of GM and Chrysler business in 2009, at a time when the US auto parts manufacturing sector, our largest industry in the United States, was running at a 45% utilization level, would have forced hundreds if not thousands of auto parts suppliers into insolvency. The effect on other North American-based automakers would have been catastrophic, reducing total US uh, 2009 auto output, we believe, by at least 90% for months, for most of the year of what was actually produced, and 50% the following year. This would have occurred because of the high rate of supplier interdependence and sole sourcing amongst all automakers. For example, studies at that time show that in 2009, 58% of the suppliers that sold to GM and Chrysler sold parts to the Asian automakers. 70% of Ford suppliers sold to GM and Chrysler. In this assumption, we are supported by Ford, Toyota, and Honda executive statements and interviews, especially Mr. Alan Mulally. Our modeling for 2009 and 2010 estimates that if there were no automotive bailout, the following impacts would have occurred in the US economy. A loss of 2.6 million jobs in 2009, and a loss of 1.5 million jobs in 2010. A total loss of $284 billion in personal income in those two years. A total loss to the federal and state budgets of $105 billion in, the form, uh, in 2009 and 10, in the form of higher transfer payments, lower social security receipts, lower personal income and property tax collections. As we all know, the full amount of federal assistance was not repaid with the sale of the new GM equity. It has also been said that the initial grant to Chrysler was not repaid, although all of their loans were with interest. Add these two deficits together and you get a total of 12.6 billion not paid back. But our analysis shows that the federal and state governments saved 105 billion in just the first two years, or eight times that $12.6 billion deficit. This is clearly a favorable cost benefit to the public in the United States. But there were other costs avoided because of the federal intervention. In 2009, there were over 600,000 retirees at GM and Chrysler alone, the majority of whom lived in the upper Midwest. A GM and Chrysler failure would have reduced and delayed their retirement income and benefits and swapped the PBGC, increasing the deep recession of the upper Midwest into a true recession. Although US production might have recovered by 2012, which I admit, or 2013, with the expansion of the international automakers and perhaps Ford, the same cannot be said for product development and R&D activities GM and Chrysler produced in the US, which would have been replaced by imported content. Finally, let's consider the psychological effect of not rescuing such mainstream manufacturing firms as GM and Chrysler might have produced in our economy at that time for Main Street companies elsewhere. We call this an industrial Lehman Brothers effect. Nobody guessed that Lehman Brothers would produce the impact it did. The shutdown of GM and Chrysler would have produced the same on Main Street. And there are the benefits we can talk about today. The US economy still contains a high-tech domestic auto industry that produced over 21% of vehicles worldwide last year. And one automaker that vies for global leadership every year. Many of the most important future technical innovations in manufacturing will be produced by this strategic industry. If we combine GM North American operating profit and Chrysler global profits, since 2010, it totals $47 billion. Chrysler and GM have announced between them, in the last four years, $16.2 billion in new investments in US operations. According to Carr's tabulation, Chrysler in particular has increased its US employment by 22,000 since the 2009, or by 64%. The company is hiring actively in multiple states today. This company has also increased its share of the US vehicle market since 2009 by 43%. As Mr. Marchioni will take, since I stole all his thunder, <laughs> will admit, they're after their 50th consecutive, I believe, month of year-over-year -year sales increases. Hardly the mark of inferior product. In conclusion, the positive benefits of a healthy, restructured domestic auto industry, Car believes, will be produced in the United States for many years to come. Carr is confident that in the years ahead, this peacetime intervention by the Automotive Task Force and the US government will be seen as one of the most successful 
in U.S. economic history. It was a brilliant job, especially given the time you guys had. <laughs> We're going to talk I'm about the time done. constraints. I, I want to open it up to questions as well. I'm going to start the first question here, but just raise your hand if you have one, and, and we'll have somebody uh, come to you with a uh, microphone. I think there's a gentleman right back here. Uh, did you have a question? Go ahead. I think we're a small enough room. You can go ahead and yell it out, and I think we'll all hear it. My name is Dave Fian. I worked in uh, Detroit for Detroit Renaissance uh, in the mid-90s. And I think, first of all, the general consensus about GM in particular and about its uh, management was, you know, was, was pretty well known at the time. But uh, I was there also as uh, we prepared to uh, uh, Daimler acquire Chrysler. And, uh, um, now we've seen Fiat do the same. Uh, the Daimler experiment didn't prove to be a success. And what's different about Fiat? Uh, what do you expect to happen as a result of that? Is, is the future better with Fiat than obviously it wasn't with Daimler? A loaded question with uh, Sergio sitting in the front row. But go ahead, Harry, you take that one. Sure, sure. And uh, I'll let, uh, obviously Sergio will do a much better job answering this when, it, when uh, he's speaking. But um, and I'll, I'll approach it from this perspective I had in 2009, where I was skeptical of the fiat deal, as Sergio knows. And it wasn't because of Sergio's talents, which are prodigious, but because Chrysler was totally hollowed out as a business. It had almost no quality products to speak of, as, as you know well. And the, the probability of successfully turning around that business was low, uh, I believed. And I actually, I think everybody believed. The question was, could Sergio still do it? And the reality is, he has. And the, the, the product quality of Chrysler well, still room for improvement, is dramatically better than it was a few years ago. And I, I also totally agree with you that Daimler totally failed uh, at that. They paid a much higher price and totally failed. But it comes down to management. And I think Sergio's done a great job, deserves a lot of credit for it, and Daimler did not. Keep raising your hands as, as uh, we're going along here. Gentleman in the, in the back there has a question. Hi, my name is Levi Tilleman. Um, I'm with the US Department of Energy, but I also have a book coming out with Simon & Schuster on the auto industry this coming February. And I'm interested in your perspective on whether car companies are actually national. You know, is there such a thing as an American car company? Or all of these just big global entities that it doesn't really matter whether we have a Toyota building cars in the United States or whether we have a GM that builds cars in the United States but also has a huge profit center in China and Europe. Cliff, you want to handle that one? Well, I mean, <coughs> certainly from a policy point of view, they're national. Um, from operations, it's global. I mean, GM is, you know, its operations in China are critical and probably become even more critical uh, in terms of its, its, its bottom line. But, you know, you have the power of your government behind you. And look what's happened uh, to the protection of, the, of, of our companies. Now, whether it should be, uh, is another matter. Um, you know, I study the airline industry, and, and I've been long advocating that that should be a global industry where we not only have open sky, but what is known as cabotage. Any airline can fly in any other country, uh, you know, routes. But, you know, there's obviously a lot of resistance to that. But I would say it sh they should be uh, global, and auto isn't the only one. Keep raising your hands and have a gentleman right here. And <coughs> We'll start with this gentleman, and then we have one uh, about halfway back. Uh, Anton van Achmal, Garten Broskov. Um, uh, Sean McAllen uh, just mentioned that, and of course this is true, that, that, that the car industry is, is a high-tech um, uh, industry. And uh, my question is, could you give some specific examples of where the American car industry, no matter what American uh, company it is, has a true global competitive advantage. And I'm not talking about the driverless car because that's not really a car industry initiative or not so much. But w what are some specific areas? Sean? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, about $100 billion was spent in automotive R&D last year. Um, our, our people uh, probably did a, a, on the order of about 13, 14% of that. Um, they obviously, uh, Ford is now number two in hybrid sales in the United States and, and in the number of matches Toyota almost in the number of models in that particular vehicle. Uh, GM is pioneering the extended range vehicles uh, for, uh, and so on and so forth. I could say there are 
obviously make their best pickup trucks on earth, but that's not a GOAT product, you know, on and, on and so forth. But the, uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, spending um, <coughs> worldwide now, we're running at about $1,200 a vehicle on product development R&D, and that might double, okay? Um, it truly is, and it's the largest manufacturing industry in the world and close to the largest R&D industry in the world. And the fact that we have a large footprint in that uh, is incredibly important. Okay, especially as we move on to connectivity um, and, and to so-called driverless cars, but even the intermediate stage of basically connecting up an advanced transportation system. Um, you know, outside of medical, the, the area that people spend their most money on worldwide, uh, in an industry that might double in size in terms of sales worldwide, we've got to be there. Uh, global leadership, our people, I think, have improved their situation in particular <coughs> dramatically the last five years since this restructuring and they have the profits that enable them right. to do that. Cliff, you had a thought? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with, with some of the positives that are mentioned, <coughs> but obviously what's running through my mind, you know, with all these strengths, how do you go from a market share of 85% to the, the 40s with expectations it's going to continue to decline? You know, well, what exactly? Years, though. I, mean, so yeah, I understand, but I'm saying, but, it's, uh, but it continues to move. That, and not in the last five years, it has. It's actually increased. It, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that, and that is the pattern. We see it go down. We see it stable. It was stable long in the 90s. It goes down. It's stable. Goes down. It's stable. This is the pattern. You know, and we've yet <coughs> really to come up with an explanation, well, really, Cliff, for Cliff. Why, why that has been going on, and then try to match that up with, you know, there are all these strengths that we, we did. So are you, are you suggesting that the bailout basically was a Band-Aid that's going to yeah, help the industry here until mid, uh, late to 2017, 2018, and then we start to see it slide again? I think it's part of a, not just a <coughs> Band-Aid, it's part of a long-run package of policies that have been attempting to, you know, uh, stabilize the industry at a increasingly lower share. There are going to be continued gaps, as we see, just as a factual matter, in, in the attributes of the vehicles, I think share will be continue to be lost, and it, it's going to go. But I, thankfully, I think it's going to stop with driverless cars. <laughs> Gentleman right here. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Uh, Jamie Albertine, I'm Steve Paul Nicholas, I'm the auto analyst there. I, look, I think many would agree dip financing wasn't there. Perhaps this, it would have been cumbersome to sell off assets. You know, the bailout made sense at the time. But is there an argument you could also make on the back end the government hanging on through the end of last year with GM did itself almost a disservice in terms of attracting management uh, from the outside that could have somehow chipped away at this cultural sort of issue that we had, uh, which I think uh, Harry alluded to earlier. Um, I understand the stock call, stock was working, but look back at what Larry just said, and I, as I understand very well, you know, 2010 to now, the stock hasn't really done that well. So, you know, we really did save 105 billion. It wasn't about the stock, and now we're behind the ball in terms of culture. Well, when let's have Harry handle that thing. because it brings up the question, should the government have unloaded their, their stake much sooner at a much more rapid pace? So it's a, it's a great question, and I think there are two or three elements to it. The first is a question of valuation. At what point should Treasury sell because obviously every sale it prints a final price. And I would argue that all the Treasury sales in the last two or three years have been at too low a price. I think the stock's woefully undervalued. You, I don't know if you have a buy rating on GM or not, uh, but I certainly believe it's woefully undervalued. Um, for a variety of reasons, we're happy to talk about it if, it, if you want to. That's the first thing. The second thing is, though, um, the government overhang. And I think the primary problem with that was not any role the Treasury played within GM, which I think it played basically no role within GM after the restructuring, uh, but the pay restrictions that were put in place as a result of that, which I think actually did hamper the ability to attract outside talent. Um, and that I, I was opposed to. Uh, you can understand politically why they were put in place. But I think it's just, I, mean, I think it's an anti-capitalist maneuver. And as, as a capitalist, I thought it was the wrong thing to do. And I think really, it, it really stifled the ability to attract talent. Um, so I think had you been able to kind of pull back the pay um, constraints or make them more market-based, then I think that could have addressed that issue. We have time for one last question. I know Dave, you got a question back there, go ahead. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Dave Sherbertson, Detroit News. Uh, two questions. You spent a lot of time looking at GM's culture. What do you think went wrong in terms of uh, the ignition switch recall and why it took so long? And at the, were you ever aware of any hint of this at the auto task force, that there was some problem like this looming? Mm. 
Oh, second question, absolutely not. Um, just be very direct and clear about that. We didn't know about anything like this. And as you know, from all the press reports, you've done a lot of reporting on this, obviously. Um, it seems to have been basically stuck in the mid-level of the engineering department and not risen above that. Uh, these are all folks we never met during, the, during our process, much less had any exposure to. Um, and given how hard it was to get data out of the company at the time, uh, even if we had asked the point blank question, I doubt we would have gotten a straight answer. Um, but um, so, so that's the first part. Um, uh, going to the earlier question, um, it sadly is emblematic of the cultural problems, I think, at the company. And there are some old cultural problems which were extremely cost conscious. Mary Barros talked about this, where they would do anything to save a penny, uh, including some really bad decisions. Uh, both economically and morally, and um, that was a uh, that was a part of the culture that was driven by a company that was living on the brink of disaster for many years prior to 2009, because of their cost structure and the and the illiquidity, uh, lack of liquidity, and so that's that was a negative thing that I think has gotten much better. I think the company is much more focused even before our work on driving um, more consumer focused decisions. The second piece of it, though, are the silos that you see, where you had legal not talking to engineering and vice versa. And from what I can tell, as evidenced by the fact that recall didn't become public until very recently, uh, that still persists. And that is something that is, has been a problem at General Motors for decades that I think Mary really needs to attack to use this, this um, uh, really crisis moment to, to go after it. Uh, I think if she can successfully, the company can continue to um, improve culturally, but it's got a long ways to go. Cliff, you had a thought? Yeah, this is an illustration of the kind of shock that can really take a dent in brand loyalty. You know, we haven't finished the full, full out, uh, fallout from this ignition situation and, and uh, the recalls <laughs> and so on and so, so forth. What, what the mechanism is, is this gives pe reason, uh, pe uh, people a reason to start looking around. And what we have learned is when they leave GM, what have you, they don't come back. And that has been the problem that the US automakers are losing their share because they're lo losing people and they're not able to get them back. If they were able to get them back and consistently be able to do it, then I'd have more hope for them. But that is exactly the problem, and this is just another shock that I think we're going to see the implications in terms of a reduction. Let, in, let me in throw share. a question out here, Cliff, then how do you explain the market share gains for Chrysler? Right. And Ford. Actually, you know. we have a loss. I'm not trying to put you too yeah, much on the spot here, but the point is <laughs> they're gaining market share consistently, and their quality uh, numbers are up. The product review uh, numbers are up. You've talked to anybody who talks with, sure. with consumers. I mean, is this a fluke in your opinion? No. I, the, the variables that go in, into vehicle purchases are numerous, not only things that we observe, but things that we don't observe. There are shocks that have been going on to other companies and other, other products. Toyota obviously has had its problems. J Japan in general, with its tsunami, has had its problems. Uh, in terms of particular niches, on the positive side, I think Chrysler has made some, some steps forward. You know, many things going on at any particular time can lead to short-term rebounds. But my point is, and what I want to just try to get across, is take a long-run view of really what's been going on with this industry. Yes, I, see, I can see some successful lines and, and some improvements here and there. But the, the, the big concern is just the long-run trend that's been going down and not a consistent uh, trend of, quote, regaining share and finally you know, putting an end to this and getting back. I just don't see it happening. We're going to wrap this up. I want each of you to quickly, not with a long answer, but a quick answer, give me this prediction. The big three in the year 2020, where will they be market share-wise? Right now, they're sitting at about 45%, I believe, in the U.S., 40, 44%, What will be the market share for the big three in the U.S. in 2020? Sean, let's start with you. Well, I think it'll be 45%, just as it has been for the last four years consecutively. You know, we've lost a little at GM. Chrysler's made it up. Ford's held out. Um, we're going to be profitable. We're going to have those 8%, 10% margins. And um, the shock will be that we'll be selling twice as much overseas um, as we do at home. And um, we've got to get used to that fact, just as if we didn't get used to the fact that we lost that earlier share and didn't downsize like we should have. Okay? And that's what caught, that was the big contributor to the bankruptcy. Um, you know, it's a big, wide world out there. 
there's a billion people on the road and it's going to go to two to three billion. And we want an industry that takes part of that in the right way. Cliff? 41.3%, 41.2% if Jaguar comes through like I expect it to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 41%. Harry, where do you see him in the year 2020? Same <laughs> plus or minus for a couple reasons. One, market share is not the end-all, be-all. True. Know, these companies got into trouble because they focus on market share. And now they're profitable. Profits, right, now they make a boatload of money. And With good margins. Market share. And so I think they'll continue to do the smart thing and invest and continue to be profitable on their core base. Second part is um, the big three are doing a great job. So is the rest of the world. Every other major car company is at its peak, more or less, in competitiveness globally. Hyundai was not on the radar screen 10 years ago, and it's doing a great job. And so as a result, you have an incredibly, brutally competitive, maybe the most competitive industry in the world right mm -hmm. now, and yet the big three are holding their own and actually increasing share in the midst of that. So I think, it's, uh, I think holding share, which I think they will, and maintaining profitability is both a laudable goal and an attainable one. Harry, Cliff, Sean, thank you guys very much.